Welcome to Trial by Wine. We take a closer look at crimes that highlight how fascinating humans can be. Schmitty, Swanee and Clarky visit crimes and run them through their jury of three, debating both sides of the case to agree an appropriate, if totally fictitious, sentence. Please be advised, Trial by Wine may include explicit or disturbing content and will include drunken rambling. Listener discretion is advised. All right, how are we? <laughs> <laughs> The band's back together. We're very yes, good. Yes, fantastic. Oh. It's exciting. Oh, no, it's good to it's see good to you. see your faces. It is. Yeah. It's been a while. It is. I must admit, Clarky came back yeah, and on the Saturday he returned and I'd seen, I'd seen on Facebook that he was on his way back and he sends me a text that morning and just says, hi, how are you? And I thought, oh, well, it seems the book is... You know, you know, like when people reach out at work and say, "Oh, can I have a chat?" And they say and nothing. Yeah. They're going to, or they're going to resign, resign or something. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. "Oh, piss off! No way!" Anyway, it wasn't that. <laughs> he was probably just asking how I am because I'd had a broken arm. No. <laughs> oh, how is it now? I forgot about that too. Correct. Yeah, yeah. A bit on the knobbly side, so not as swollen as it was, but it's got a weird. Yeah. It's hard to see on the camera, but it's got. I this can't weird, see the light, no. but it does look a bit like, bigger than the other one. I was just saying that that lump on Schmidt's arm. Um, if it gets any bigger, it's going to be like that poor bloke that had a penis on his forearm. And so, oh, you know, when that. she goes, she yeah, they re grew one. That was to your story. Sleeve, or she can't light the gas stove anymore because that lump is going to get in you the just way. You just need to tuck it into a sleeve. <laughs> just need like an elasticated <laughs> sleeve to sort that out, and you'll be fine. You can just loll about just inside keep the elasticated inside the sleeve. Pirate blouse. Have you given yeah. it a name? No, no, I haven't. It Call wasn't, it Johnson. I was just trying to say it. Okay, all right. Well, Johnson is a bit upsetting, but, you know, it's not like I'm a hand model or anything. Yeah, no, I, I, when, the minute I came out of the cast, I thought, that doesn't look right. But Well, don't know about that. No, oh, <laughs> that wasn't there before. Johnson, um, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, no, the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Whose handiwork oh, is this? Bloody NHS. <laughs> oh, Butterching. Who do I need to speak to? <laughs> yes, Butterching. <laughs> <laughs> oh god the hand therapist thinks it's all tendon damage so Ooh. that's why it's swelling it's inflamed oh, yeah. tendons and stuff. Still, does it still hurt you if i move it the wrong way it does and when he's got he's got me doing these oh god that hurts these little oh, exercises wow. and that really hurts to do oh, that all right. yeah that's that's my rehab right. and this one i've got throwing a dart that's one of my rehabs. Well, they go. Oh. <laughs> For our listeners, we were just doing blowjob faces. Sorry. <laughs> oh, this is. I'm sure that's what your male physio was saying. This is. This, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. Do. Lollipop. Lollipop, lollipop. Yep. Ooh, lolly, lolly, lolly. Lucky you're good at acting, or he might have said, Do you need a prop for that exercise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. Yes. Uh, I suppose we're very excited because we're all back together and. Uh, we're a bit giddy. We're a bit giddy with it, but I suppose <laughs> we should crack on and introduce ourselves. I'm Schmitty. I'm Swatty. And I'm Clarky. And together we are. Trial, Trial by. by- Wine. Wine. Excellent. And what are we drinking? Go on, well, Swanee. Uh, true to form, you. very imaginatively. Oh, my God. A, a you literally just zero. went Sorry. and got a drink and that's what you got. What you got? I know. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's very disappointing. What oh, are you guys doing? I was doing? excited because you were going exciting. to get a drink and you came back with that. It was just, it wasn't alcoholic. Well. Sorry. Oh, look, everyone's huffing and very disappointed in me. Hopefully you make it up for me. At, at some point when we were unemployed, we decided that what we really needed is a wine fridge. And then we decided we needed to fill it with wine. And <laughs> there's a winery up the road from us that doesn't have a cellar door. They don't open the cellar door. They just sell directly into restaurants and whatever. Anyway, they have sold. And so the people who owned it decided they needed to sell all of their back vintage. So yes. oh. they had a sale and all of the wines were between 30 and 50% off. So, Schmidt, do you remember the wine mm. I got you for your for your wedding, for your participation in our wedding, Star Lane? Yes. It's a red. Yes. It's it a, fair, I fair, do very, it? very good reds. So yeah. we went and spent a squillion dollars filling our wine fridge on their wines that were, you know, 30 to 50% off. And so today we're having uh-huh. a Star Lane Shiraz from 2019, which is the Ooh, cheapest of the lovely. bunch that we got, and it's bloody delicious. Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks a little bit like this in case you're ever out and you're, you're looking for a, that's it. 
Very nice. Plot. And they Good said drops, to us because we spent one. so much all money, right. come back in the new year and we'll um, – oh, they're all good drops. All yeah. the reds are good drops. But they said, come back in the new year, we're bottling our Chardonnay and we can uh, get you some of that too. We're like, yeah, can do. See you soon. Wine country is good country. Anyway, I that's what we're drinking, Schmitty, What about you? I am drinking because I was a little bit, let's just say, full when it comes to the alcoholic beverages. Yesterday, I've been a little bit um, sensitive about things today, so I thought I'd start on a very mild. <laughs> this here's me showing my class Malibu and Coke. A very mild Malibu and Coke. Oh gosh, oh. you didn't get the wipeout? Grunt as that. No, this is mm, the this a little is bit the top sweet. shelf yeah. version. Remember, but it's very oh, sweet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As rich people have been it's running, the billionaire you, yeah, Malibu. You. You're just throwing money around now, Absolutely Schmitty. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. In point of fact, I didn't even pay for this. It was <gasps> left over from some party. But that's what happens, right? That's what happens to the ritual. They don't even have to pay. Everyone does it for them. Someone just left it here and I'm just like, oh, I don't yeah, drink that. Right. I was going to have a standard pirate juice and then I thought, oh, I don't know. I think I'll just start with a very sweet Malibu. Mm. <laughs> so a bit weird, but that's what I'm on. I'm a little bit fragile. All right. Sorry, I'm about to belch. A little bit of post alcohol <laughs> reflux. Oh, a little bit of acid yep. they're doing. Yep, yep, yep. It's the it's because you're so talking it's... to poor people. You need a quick ease. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's just, just oh. sets me. It, 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 but, oh, you oh, on this I guess you get nausea. Oh, as, a, nausea. <laughs> as a poor person myself, <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> like you're all just jealous that I'm just hobnobbing, that's all. <laughs> it does feel like an episode of Little Britain or something, doesn't it? <laughs> Remember one of them bombarded all the time? I can't remember. Yeah. David yes, Williams. What yes. was that? I can't remember. I don't remember the setup, but I know he vomited. Um, was it <laughs> a lot? Anne, who used to vomit all the time. Yeah, Anne did all the ways. Maybe. In the, no, I think that was Margaret who did the. Wasn't oh, Anne the. No, it was Anne the. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shouldn't laugh. Crime. It's not even That's that crime. funny, yeah. but at the time, oh my God. Oh. Yeah, I remember, I I remember that, going uh, and seeing um, Little Britain live and the person I went with, so there was the woman who vomited oh. all the time and the person I went with, we drank so much, she ended up vomiting in her cup at her seat. Well, you've told us that. In the story. middle of the <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was so bad, so bad. Oh, my so God. Little Britain live, anyway. something that wouldn't happen anymore. Oh, my God. Yeah, right. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. I, was like, yeah. I, I think it speaks volumes that the people that I really, I, I did used to, well, I did used to, I haven't said a lot of it, but I was a big fan of Little Britain of the Day, but I still really like, is it Chris Lilly? It's so bad to like him, but I just think is his it? stuff is just, I'm, oh, apparently yes. he's cancelled. Yeah, yeah, the oh, Aussie he but I, Oh, my God. Bad? Yeah, and so really? occasionally something called Pop Up, that's oh, him. Dickie yeah, yeah, Jamey, you know, remember, oh, everything yeah. is. But I just, I look back at that Chris Lee thing and I think it's yes. when he's Mr G. I fucking it's love Mr. G that. Mr G is my favourite. Yeah. Absolutely, oh, oh. when he's like, oh, it's cracking so it. It's my favourite by far. They're having that. a sense of humour is cancelled, basically. Yes. Anywho, right. um, now yeah. I was just going to say, of my Malibu choice, you know, in hindsight, probably I should have gone straight to the pirate juice. For today is a nautical story. Oh, mm. <gasps> just sit right back and you hear a tale. Here. Oh, you will you ever? Okay. So now, as you all know, I have a few secret naughtinesses. One being Josh Gates and his Expedition Unknown series, secret and the other is Naked and Afraid, yes. of course. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Though in fairness, yes. I haven't watched uh, Naked and Afraid one. for ages. Oh, I'm getting to it. Um, because that Billionaire and Afraid. Naked and Afraid. Well, actually, yes. Maybe not billionaires, but definitely very rich people, <laughs> right? Naked billionaires. No, they're generally yeah, yeah. not naked, no. They're usually <laughs> closed. But, yes, with the old Naked and Afraid, it got a bit same-same. There's only so many hours of watching people wander around inhospitable jungles or deserts naked and hungry and forced to eat the least delicious tidbits nature provides. And the roundup on that is find water, build shelter, make fire, suffer for as long as you can, walk a long way to get extracted. Well, you said there's only so many hours you can spend. How many is that? Oh, my God, I watched. At what point was it? I, I think I probably watched like hundreds. 40, 50 hours of it, might have been. Yeah, right. It was right. when I had my hip replaced, so I had plenty of time to be sitting there watching it's it. It's a lot then. It was, yeah, yeah. But my latest secret naughtiness discovered when, again, I was still convalescing is... with my hip, is the Bravo Channel's Below Deck franchise. Oh, dear God. 
Oh, how oh, dear God. What? You judgy, McJudgy. <clears throat> is that something that's fairly recent or have oh. you been watching it for something? Well, well, so I started watching it with my hip. They're up to, that, for the Mediterranean one, I think they're front, on season 11, so it's been running. Well, less of the naked, not so much afraid. I'll, I'll get onto it. I'll explain it. It's right? assholes on a boat being looked after by a crew, isn't it, essentially? <laughs> From what I said, sometimes they're lovely, just like Zach. I, I've never seen. Sometimes I've never seen it. Episode. Lovely. I always think they're people who are trying really hard. They've been asked, you know, they've got some kind of comp deal to go on it. Yeah, and they got to behave. I will tell you that the guests who actually have some money. Oh, to- I know what you're going to say here before you they're start. They're nice. Correct. They're all yeah. nice. Yeah, they're people who actually have money. It's the, stuff. Yeah. It's the ones that. No, oh, oh, yeah, well, that's the a whole different story. Friends of the rich yeah. people. When it comes to the when correct, it comes to they the behave rich people. Not a, yep. It's the not, or, or even yes. some of them, like they had a a charter in. I can't remember which series in because of a lot of. I've only ever seen this. the ones where in the Caribbean or something. I don't think I've ever seen a Mediterranean one. Well, there was one I was watching. I think it might have been Down Under, and they had these. Oh God. They had influencers, right? Oh. Social media influencers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They were all taking photos of themselves and being wankers. But the worst part about it was they were pretty offensive and they were, and but I think they actually left a really shitty tip as well. Like the mm-hmm. tips are usually between sixteen and twenty five thousand US dollars. And these guys left some tiny tip and in, in earlier that all that's so shitty. Well it is because it's divided by the crew, right? Which is usually about nine people. So, you know, they and I don't think they get a huge salary to be on these charters no. in the first place. And it's uh, oh. prorated. So the tip is everything. And they work really hard to get the tip. And when you've got really demanding nasty yeah, yeah. customers and then they just give yeah. you a shit tip. It's like but I laugh because the chef at the time, he was like, Seriously, you can make money just taking photos and putting them on Instagram? Like that's amazing. And then when the tip came out, it goes, hmm, clearly not much that much money, hey. And I was Correct. like, Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Partners. Uh, yes. So for you, Clarky, because I know you don't watch anything in the reality genre. A realm. Uh, Below Deck is a docuseries, sort of, that follows the trials and tribulations of the staff aboard luxury super yachts, a career that if I had known about it 30 years ago, I reckon I'd have given it a red hot crack. Really? Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm far yeah, too old nice. for it now, but I look at it, I think I would have been bloody good at that. There are four departments pretty much on a super yacht. There's the captain who's pretty much the managing director of the boat. They, they ensure, sorry, that the boat doesn't sink, sail around a bit and sometimes schmooze with the guests, but their main role is to manage the staff um, and they, the some Costa of them Concordia do it more than others and some of them do the it. role of a captain. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> I'm so impressed you remember the name of that. Oh, yeah. well, who, how could you forget it? <laughs> isn't, it the captain yeah. who, isn't it the captain who got off yeah. before all the died? Yeah. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. I'm yeah. out of here. Thanks. He crashed it and then he got off. He yeah, crashed See it ya. and then he it. said, shit, yeah. this isn't good. I'm out of here. Yeah. So there's the interior, which is managed by a chief steward, and they look after everything inside the boat. So the guest cabins, the toilets, table settings and service, guest entertainment at night usually, beach picnics, all that sort of stuff. They are housekeeping and event managers and usually have two stewards under them who invariably fight with one another or they hate the chief and spend all their time bitching. <laughs> is the interior one the one who looks after the bloke that on our cruise that drank so much, had a fight with his wife, got locked out of the room and was literally sitting on the floor at the front of his door with food and drink scraps left around him, completely passed out in the doorway like this. Crying. <laughs> is that interior? Yes. That would look after that? <laughs> interior would be managing that. Yes, no, <laughs> interior would deal with that. Although on the cruise of the sites you're what talking about, obviously job. there's a much larger, much larger interior team. Yeah. But I've met plenty of people on those cruises who are working them who go from one boat to another and it's a career and they love it. But this is a much smaller, we're talking much smaller. So whilst yeah. they're super yachts, so usually I think about 100, right. and f- well, anything from about 55 metres to maybe 100 metres, they have a crew of usually about nine people on yeah. board and they're usually only catering to about eight customers at a time on a charter. So it's much more discreet yeah, than a yeah. massive cruise. Yeah. So then there's the deck team, which is led by a bosun or a first officer. They're responsible for endless cleaning of the teak floors, stainless steel railings, windows, windows, spa. And they, all they do is clean, right, uh, constantly. They also set up the water toys, yeah, which is go. managing the dock and manage the docking process with fenders the and heating and hauling toys. the ropes. Unloading and loading guest baggage and maintaining the tenders, and they help a little bit with the interior on occasion. The water toys are things like the slides. And if you've ever watched it, 
If you're if you're out there somewhere, no, Captain Sandy, stop making people deal with a goddamn slide. It is a waste of everyone's time. I don't care that the guests really expect it or <laughs> like it. You're actually causing injuries. It's a work health safety issue. Cut it out, Sandy. Anyway. It's this, is this Schmidt's occupational violence training coming to the front? It's not morning? my favourite captain, FYI. <laughs> I think I think I only know I quite I think possibly sometimes I, I think, I think I've only ever, I've only think I've ever management training I tell you I think I've yeah. only ever seen Captain Sandy in the ones that I've seen but mine are probably a bit older that I've watched that might be why you don't like watching it have you watched anyway, it too I'm just saying, <laughs> I've seen it yeah I don't I've, watch I've it but I've seen it I've got a few captains now Captain Lee who's now retired the only oh, the only people Cap- I've ever seen are like groups of people who have come from no offense to Jersey but they're like from Jersey and then they're I don't know. They're That's very bit trashy and very. Is it? Is it? Well, this, well I've only seen the Caribbean. Season, yeah. No, I've only seen in the Caribbean. The ones that I've seen. That, that, they're that so old. The, is that the OG? That's the probably. Original yeah, it would deck, certainly yeah. be close to it because I'm I'm aware that there are other ones, but I've never seen it. But the ones that, that I watched, that, the people that, that would have been Captain really Lee. That would have been like he's got a, a, a grey beard. White beard. Yeah, yeah, white beard, white hair. Oh, so that's him. That's one thing of. If you keep this up, I'm gonna chew your ass, and everyone's like, "I don't." Yeah, that's him. That's what I've seen. Are you still saying these things, Captain Lee? (laughs) He thinks he's abusing people, but he's actually making comments that are not quite right and they sound a bit sexual. And he doesn't do it on purpose at all. Anyway, so the fourth is the galley after the deck of the interior. It's usually one chef responsible for all charter meals and crew meals. Oh, we like the galley. Yeah, but personally I think the chef has the hardest role as they're cooking basically from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and the tips are largely driven by the dining experience. No, what I mean is we like yep. them because they fill our belly. We love them. Some of oh, them are so psychos, he gets but we love the them. And, the- and then has to share them. He or she, Yes. They work oh, very yes. hard and it's yes, just them, point. right? So if they fall over, if they break their yeah, back, yeah. if they, there's no one else to do it. That's a very tough job. And sometimes I'm not sure that the other crew truly appreciate the pressure that the chef is under. Yeah. Anyway, just saying, yeah, as, a, as yeah. an observer of the yes. programs. Horrible. Oh, my God. And some of these chefs are so impressive. Well, in fact, almost all of them, they might be – nightmares in the actual galley to the crew but when you see what they turn out my giddy aunt the number of times i sit there thinking yeah, oh i don't yeah, want to eat yeah. that why am i not there it's so it looks so great yeah okay so i it would I have to be below for deck. star food too wouldn't it that's all right i get onto this thing about five star a little bit later and my opinion on what really is five star but the food certainly usually is yes I'm not sure that some of the other elements of the service is, but that is. Now, I started with Below Deck Mediterranean and then Down Under, uh, but lately I've gotten into a spin-off which is Below Deck Sailing Yacht. Unlike the other franchises, they have that have powered boats with very fancy bridges that feature flat screens for radar, depth finders and GPS navigation. Of course you haven't. You never watch this sort of television. True. The sailing yacht boat is the Parsifal 3. And it's a proper sailboat, which adds complexity to the deck team's work as they have to understand the rigging and the impact of wind and weather conditions in in terms of using it. So as a means to propel the boat. Oh, well, all the others are super, the other super yachts are powered. All so right. you just, it's like going out in right. a giant Sorry, black and white. Understand. Yes. So actually sail. Yes, I yeah. understand. Yeah. It also creates havoc for the interior and galley as when the boat is tacking, Anything not stowed away is likely to smash and serving clients when under sale is much more difficult. Imagine the floor you're serving mar- margaritas on is tipping at a 20-degree angle. Yes. The Parsifal mm. 3 is a 54-metre, yes. 460-gross-ton yacht which accommodates 12 guests and nine crew. And on the Parsifal there Solid. is an engineering department. Mm. It's just one guy, but he's sort of part of the cast on uh, that particular franchise. But generally the engineers are these sort of grumpy-looking old European guys who stay downstairs and they're never on camera unless something goes terribly wrong because they're not kind of features the cast because I'm guessing they don't fit the type that they go for for the cast, i.e. young and horny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, alert on that. The things that make these programs interesting to watch are the relationships between the crew. As I said, usually young, under 35, and in it for the tips and party lifestyle when they're not on charter, of course. It's a powder keg set up with nine people working at close quarters, living together 24-7 for about two months, I think, is the season. And there's usually 
bitch fights, fa- uh, factions, love interests, and alcohol-driven bad decisions. And as I said, I've been watching The Sailing One lately. Sounds like a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah, it is, which made me think more about the story I'm telling today. But first, my sources. Wikipedia, Time Magazine, AmericanMuseum.com, TheFamilyNation.com, HistoryDaily.org, All That's Interesting.com, Nine Honey, Mamma Mia, CBS News, and the Reader's Digest book, and a book called Alone by Richard Logan and Terry Fass- Fassbender. So, today's story is oh. set on a sailing yacht. I was, I was hoping if it was going to be a boat related at this point. Yes. <laughs> Now, the yacht in question in this story is a little bit smaller <laughs> than the Parsifal 3. It was 18 metres long, so about a third the size of the um, Parsifal and three metres longer than my houseboat to sort of give it give you some kind of uh, sense of size. Still a sizable sailboat and probably not one you'd consider like a trailer boat. So it's just that it's just a little bit too big to be putting on a trailer. As it turns out, the story isn't really about the catch. Like Below Deck Sailing Yacht, the boat is simply a glamorous backdrop for the machinations of the people on board. Oh. So let's talk about the people. It starts with Arthur Duperolt. Arthur was born in 1921 and grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. A slight young man, Arthur hit the gym to bulk up in order to join the Navy. Hang on, what year are we in then? Well, right now we're about to go into 1942, but he was the 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 action takes place in 1961, but we are not in 1961 yet. Right. Okay. So Arthur bulked up so that he could join the um, uh, so the navy in 1942, and served in Southeast Asia as a medic. Whilst he traipsed the jungles of Burma, now Myanmar, and witnessed the horrors of war, he gained a love of the sea on his voyages with the navy. Leaving the Navy in 1945, Arthur went home to Wisconsin with his wife, Jean, who he had met whilst working for the Pentagon in Washington. Hmm. Jean had been a secretary at the FBI and they had married in 1944. By 1947, Jean and Arthur had had a little boy, Brian, and were living with Arthur's parents in De Pere, I think it is, or De Perry, Wisconsin. Arthur studied optometry in Chicago and graduated in 1949 and then set up his own optometrist practice in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The following year, Jean and Arthur welcomed their second child, Terry Joe, and Arthur continued to build his practice, finding success in selling contact lenses, which were the new big thing at the time. I bet. And in 1954, Arthur and Jean welcomed their third child, Renee. Both Arthur and Jean were active in their community and well-respected and liked. Arthur had a brush with fame when he spent hours digging the family collie out of a pit that it had fallen into, and on another occasion he saved a child from drowning. He also continued his love of sailing, competing in ice sailing, which looks really bloody dangerous. It's like a little single... Ice sailing. It's like a very... like almost like a kayak with a sail on it and it's got like a catamaran steering thing and it's on blades and you're, you're actually sailing as in being on propelled by wind but on ice. Yeah, ice, ice sailing, what? yeah. It looks – and they get to massive speeds. Wrong? Like it's really – Exactly right. But he did also sail on water that wasn't frozen with some friends of his who owned bigger vessels as the sea had made its way into his blood. And he's from Wisconsin. Originally, Wisconsin is pretty much landlocked. They've got the Great Lakes up there. It's very cold in the, it's very cold in the winter, but he loved the sea and he loved sailing. But, you know, he can't I'm do on that. maps. Can't do you that know, I couldn't help myself. When you're course, you are, of course. You are. It's right there on Lake <laughs> Michigan. Expect nothing less. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. Oh, you said I had to find. So, Green Bay is this little lake. Well, it's a little bay that comes off Lake Michigan. So, yeah, yeah, it would be. They're the Great Lakes, aren't they? Aren't they? So yeah, that would. Yeah, so yeah. very central um, U.S. But I didn't know where Wisconsin was. Midwest, that, isn't it? That, that panicked me. Correct. High, yeah. like lakes, like not. Just, High up. So yeah. you've got uh, uh, to, above Minnesota. it will be lake, and then Minnesota. Correct, yeah. and above it will be lake, and then above it Canada. Yeah. So very cold, very, very cold, central. Yeah. So Arthur was also a very involved father with his children. Uh, the kids had recollections of him, you know, like he'd patch them up when they injured themselves. You know, he wasn't the kind of dad who was just working all the time and not involved with anything, but he was working very hard to get his business up and running because, you know, they, he didn't necessarily come from a great deal of wealth, but he was definitely building up a very successful optometry business but, you know, he'd been doing that for about 10 years and he started to be concerned that he wasn't spending enough time with his kids, right? And I think he was a bit worried about, 
as they were getting older, that you, you know, you, know hit, you hit the tipping point where if you're not going to spend the time with them now, they'll grow up, they'll move on and they'll do their own thing and you kind of miss out on them. So he decided a good way to combine his love of sailing and spend more time with his family would be to take some time out from his business, sign the kids out of school and take them on a sailing adventure down south. Wisconsin, as I said, landlocked and cold, so a summer sailing adventure had huge appeal for the family. They had all been on sailboats, but not for any extended period of time, and they decided to do a taster trip first to see how they would get on together in a confined boat because it's quite different, the, the romantic ideal of being on a boat with all your family and then the reality of it. <laughs> no, well, this is quite sensible. They said, look, we'll yeah. take some time out. With the view to extend it to a year, I think what he wanted to do was actually almost sail to Asia because that's what he'd done in the Navy when he was young and he really loved it. But we'll start with a small taster type trip and the idea was to go down to Florida and charter a boat and do a bit of sailing in the Bahamas. So they pack up the car and a bit of a small trailer and they head on down to Florida, which, you know, frankly must have taken a bloody long time in 1961. So as I said, they went out to Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, to get themselves a boat. Now, at the same time as the Duperolts were planning their family sailing adventure, Julian Harvey was signing on as the captain of the Blue Bell, which is an 18-metre catch in Fort Lauderdale. Julian Harvey was a bona fide hero. He had had a distinguished career in the Air Force, flying fighter planes in the Second World War and the Korean War. By all accounts, Julian was a charismatic and good-looking guy who was into pumping iron and keeping fit well before it became trendy. He had a bit of a stammer and, from what I understand, a wonky eye. Uh, But these things seemed to make him more relatable to people and he was pretty well liked. And he was certainly well liked by the ladies. Oh. Because he'd been married quite a few times. At the time of his being hired to Captain the Bluebell, he was on his sixth marriage at the ripe old age. I think he was 44. He was 44 at this point, yeah. Cheapers. Up to wife six, yep. And her name was Mary Dean or Deanie, I'm not sure. He was liked by the ladies for three months. I uh, know. I think he was the one who was like, oh, he yeah, let just thanks for that next. Yep. Yeah, right. Okay. So Denny had been a flight attendant for TWA and they'd been married for four months. She was also employed by the boat's owner to act as chef and chief stewardess when the boat was chartered. So she was taken on the shitty job in the galley of cooking all the time as well as cleaning the heads, cleaning the cabins. Not that It's a much smaller boat, but there's still some work to be done here and uh, entertaining the guests. The Blue Belt was about a third the size of the Parsifal, so its accommodations were not as salubrious but it did have provision to sleep five charter guests and two crew. The crew cabin was at the front of the boat. Hang so on, five five guests? And two crew. And yeah. two so, crew. And does okay. that include him? Yeah, he's the crew. The captain and his wife right. are the crew. And her. Right, and the it. family yeah. of five being the Duperolts. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's a perfect fit really, this boat. So the front, very front of the boat you had the crew cabin and it went sort of in a shape of a V. You know, mm-hmm. so it was, and it birthed, I think, two people. And it was actually separated from the rest of the boat because it was forward of the mast. Right. And so it yep. was actually like, you, I think you went around the side to get into it. You couldn't get right mm-hmm. through from inside. And that's mm-hmm. kind of why it was the crew one because they were sort of, yeah, had their privacy in there. The master cabin was in the middle of the boat and accommodated two adults. There was a galley and dining area that converted into a sleeping berth at night and a further three-quarter berth at the stern of the boat on the starboard side. I think it was the starboard side. So the back of the boat, you've got the engine room on one side and you've got this smaller cabin. In mm-hmm. the middle of the boat, you've got a galley, like a caravan bit, you know, like where it converts the dining area of a caravan, it turns into a double yep. bed at night. Yep, yep. And then further in, you've got a master cabin, which I think was queen or double bed with a yep. bit of storage and a table. Yeah. Okay. So, unfortunately, there aren't many pictures of the Bluebell, so I have been working off written descriptions, but I'm pretty sure that the way I described that was right. The only bit I'm a little unclear on is that that galley area, as you went upstairs, so you could go into the three-quarter into the engine room, but if you went upstairs, you went into an area called the cockpit, and the cockpit is really the uh, above on top of the deck. deck. Above deck. No, it's above deck, and it's where they steer, so the steering wheel would be behind. It's not like the snake pit, is it? where people were sitting around in the cockpit. So it's, it's a bit above deck. Anyway, it was a perfect size for the family of five, particularly three small children. And when the Duperolts arrived in Fort Lauderdale, they chartered the boat for a week's sailing as their test run. 
I also read in several accounts, but I couldn't find any evidence of this being true, that Arthur and Julian had been previously acquainted, although they were friends. But I really don't know if that is the case because I think people have just drawn a bit of a bow because they were both ex-military. Yeah. I couldn't see anything that they were mates. On the 8th of November 1961, the Duperolts boarded the Bluebell with the Harveys, loading the kids and their gear, including Brian's 22 calibre rifle on board, with the plan to sail to the Bahamas. Brian's the, old, the boy, the oldest boy. Oh, right. I, I just look at my notes going, oh, right, so he's the boy. Brian's the oldest boy. Yeah, he's about 14, I think. They were starting with the <laughs> island of... Bimini. Yeah, I always insist my kids bring their uh, rifles <laughs> When we go on holidays, be, be armed, boys. Of the time, of the time. Yeah. And then to Sandy Point, a village on the southwest edge of Great Abaco Island. Now, when asked where, why he took the rifle, Brian declared it was to shoot sharks. Hmm. And in case you think that's weird, Swanee, it did remind me of standing on the roof of the houseboat with Wu and Captain Schmidt whilst the cap shot at the carp with our 22. <laughs> Shooting carp. Back in the olden days. Yep. Exactly that's right. right. Boom. <laughs> Now, the family did have a really lovely time. They were snorkeling, collecting shells, hanging out on idyllic beaches. At the same time, Deanie wrote to her mother complaining about how much work she had as a chief chef in a stew mm-hmm. and not a single minute to herself. Very like all the chief stews I've observed on Below Deck. Shout out to Hannah, Kate Chastain, Daisy, Bugsy and Aisha. It's a lot harder than it looks. Early Sunday, they stopped by the office of Sandy Point Village Commissioner Roderick W. Pinder to fill out the forms for leaving the Bahamas and returning to the United States. This has been a once-in-a-lifetime vacation, Arthur told Pinder. We'll be back before Christmas. That night, Deanie Harvey prepared a dinner of chicken cacciatore and salad. Now, I don't mean to be too critical of Deanie, but that meal would not have cut it on the below-deck yacht. (laughs) Captain Sandy would have been all up in her grill (laughs) about it not being five-star, and sometimes she says (laughs) seven-star quality. Seriously, they hire 20-somethings with minimal experience, I know exactly, to crew multi-million dollar boats and call it five-star service. It's good, don't get me wrong, but when you see them for breezing the pillows, it does make you wonder. Anyway, around 2 12.35 p.m., they do, oh, right? No. And they've the pillows. I'm like, what is that? And why what? are you showing me that? Like, seriously. What is that? To charter, I looked up, to charter the Parsifal 3, it costs 245,000 euro. And that's for, I think, a two- or three-day charter. And you get Febreze pillows? Anyway. No, thanks. Around, what? Around what would you be expecting in that place? I'm confused. Fresh linen, just freshly cleaned and fresh laundered linen. But they can't. Yeah. On a, you like, know, they do. They constantly not do. Not every day, There's, though. They do. There is a steward in laundry nonstop. I, I, Fair I, enough. I, do, I, I don't I almost can't that, yeah. believe how much laundry they do, right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The poor person is just there washing and washing and drying and folding. Oh, and yeah, get, yeah, oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Around 12.35, oh, not even every day, just like start with fresh linen, but the Febrezing just feels a little, I don't know, crap. Um. Mm. Around 12, do you use something else? Don't use Febreze. Like a linen spray. I get it. Use saying. a yeah, nice yeah, linen yeah. spray. I, I, thought yeah, that's yeah. What, I was just wondering if that's what you meant. Yes, I'm with if you, you. If you have to spray it, use a linen spray, not bloody Febreze, right? <laughs> $5.50 $5. at Coles. At around 12.35 on Monday, <laughs> November the 13th, a crew member, now this is important. Hang on, focus. hang on, hang on. Which date were we? So we are now, so the last, on Sunday night, we had the chicken cacciatore. Cacciatore, yep. Mm. And salad. So that's a Sunday. So this yep. is 12.35 on Monday, the Morning. November the 13th. So afternoon, noon. Oh, my, oh sorry, 12.30 uh, afternoon. afternoon. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So a crew member on the oil tanker Gulf Lion spotted a man waving from a dinghy. He was shouting, help, I'm Julian Harvey, the master of the Bluebell. I have a dead baby on board. What? Mm. So How old was him- Renee? She wasn't a baby, was she? Oh, she was seven, I think. She wasn't yeah. a baby. Right, okay. She wasn't a baby, but he Just called checking, her baby. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, he was he referring to her? <gasps> yeah. So she's oh, dead. Oh. <gasps> oh. Yeah, no, they, they, pulled him, they pulled him aboard the oil Gosh. tanker as well as the very sadly lifeless body of Renee, the youngest of the Duperolds. She was with him? Hmm. Okay. Julian told the crew that at about 8.30 the previous night, so the Sunday night, chicken catch Tory night, the boat was hidden was hit by a sudden squall, which made the boat keel over and snap the mast. He said everyone had been hanging out in the cockpit, so that open bit I was talking about, 
And it was a lovely night and everyone was having a nice time. The kids were having a little nap and everything was good when suddenly this wind came out of nowhere and caused the mast to break and fall directly down and through the hull and it damaged fuel lines on the way. So it smashed, fell straight down, smashed through the hull uh, and damaged some fuel lines. It also brought down the mizzen and probably the mainsail and so there was rigging and cables and sails on people there was talk about splinters that had injured Arthur and Denny. He just said to everyone, calm down. Uh, he was trying to get some cable cutters to get through the fallen rigging to try and make things all right. But then a fire broke out from the uh, broken gas lines. And in one version of the story, he said that he saw the adults jump overboard, basically. And Arthur had been steering the boat at this time. He had the engine going because he was trying to stop it from sinking directly because it through movement it's not just going to fill up immediately so it, and he had the bilge and pumps he's the going captain? yeah arthur was an experienced sailor so it's not unreasonable to say here well this is emergency you steer the boat while i do these things and so mm. he, he was sort of doing that but then he said he saw in the end arthur jump off the back of the boat towards the others and he thought that they'd got the life rings you know the life preservers and the, the kids were all in life jackets that's what he thought he saw and then he jumped off the boat himself because he realised he couldn't, he was separated from the rest of them by the fire. He couldn't do anything. He jumped in the water, he got into the dinghy and unfortunately later he saw the body of Renee floating past um, and so he pulled her aboard the life raft and tried to resuscitate her but it was too late. Gosh, how terrible mm. for him. It was shocking, wasn't it? It was very, yeah, exactly. And understandably the crew of the Gulf Line were very sorry for him and they organised him to be transferred to Nassau for a questioning. While some people were not quite sure about his version of events, with no survivors or other witnesses, uh, they let him return to Miami and I believe some of the crew of the Gulf Line and others actually did a bit of a hand around and got some money for him so that he could fly back because he had nothing. Everything had gone down with the Bluebell including his wife, wife. but let's yeah. not forget. Yeah. And he did have to attend a further hearing in Miami uh, with the Coast Guard, which I'm not surprised at. I think that's pretty much process given his wife and the Duperot family were missing, presumed dead. So it was during this hearing on November 16, so only three days later, Swanee. Yep. Back in the Bahamas, though, that a miracle was taking place. No way. The second officer of the Greek freighter, Captain Theo, Nicholas Spakadakis yep, noticed it. a small yep, nailed it. Spakadakis noticed a small white object <laughs> bobbing out about in the distance. It looked very like a white cap, but as it wasn't quite behaving like a wave. So you know when a white cap mm-hmm. comes over and crashes and then it sort of disappears yeah. oh, in yeah, the next yeah. one. This it sort is, of was yeah, still there around. all the time. Yeah. Upon closer inspection it revealed itself as the truth. <laughs> At first he thought it might be a fisherman, but it was miles too far out for a fisherman to be there. And so he said to the captain, hey, look, there's a thing over there, and the captain changed course to intercept whatever this thing was. Imagine their surprise when they realised it was an oblong raft with a little blonde girl wearing a white blouse and pink corduroy pants. No. The freighter lowered a raft and a crew member to move her into it because there were actually sharks circling around and so they're like, don't get in the water. Oh, my God. <laughs> don't get in the water, <sighs> you know, and so they got her into the raft. She was then taken on board and put in a cabin whilst they contacted the Coast Guard. She was given water and orange juice as she was terribly dehydrated, unable to speak much, and she was in and out of consciousness. She pretty much just said the word bluebell and identified that she was Terry Joe Duperol, and then she passed out. Terry Joe was airlifted to Miami Hospital to undergo treatment for severe dehydration, sunburn and exposure. Now, as I mentioned earlier about Naked and Afraid, you can live for 21 days. So in Naked and Afraid, my other secret naughtiness, it's a 21-day challenge because you can actually go without food for 21 days and not die, but you can only go without water for three days. Yeah. Apparently, well, I can't. I would, I would kill someone yeah, no, before I, no. you know. But, that's on, that's on but TV. That's not real. You can. You can. It was not good for you, but you can. So she had been out there for nearly four days at this point. <gasps> and so she and was literally was she? on the brink of death. Eleven. Um, she was literally on the brink of death. So she'd been floating around 84 hours, just over three days, nearly four days. The lack of water had taken a serious toll on her body. But back in uh, Miami where we were having this hearing, news came in that Terry Joe had, had been found alive. 
And when Julian heard this, he stammered, oh, my God, why, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, at this point in the hearing, he'd given his testimony and other people were now giving theirs, so he'd done his bit, but he'd been told, you can stay if you want, it's your right to listen to everything. Um, and he was happy to stay and listen, but when he heard about Terry Joe, he just excused himself, saying he was really tired and he wanted to go speak to his family. So he left. Apparently one of the investigators, because as I said, they weren't really buying his story, and there's a whole raft of, no pun intended, detail about <laughs> why it was a bit off. Least of all, the mast going straight through the boat like that. Because if, if the boat was keeling in the way he suggested, the mast would have fallen down at an angle. It wouldn't have gone angle. through the hull the way yeah, he was yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that was, that was really quite yeah. odd. Also, he didn't use flares. There's a whole bunch of other things. And the, lo and behold, the dinghy that he was in was fully stocked. So, you know, he, he, he was relatively prepared. They didn't really believe him and uh, totally, but they didn't have any evidence otherwise. But someone did actually ask for police or security to be put on to Terry Joe at the hospital after he left the inquiry because they thought maybe Julian was dodgy. And when he left, they thought, well, we don't want him going over to the hospital, you know, and doing the wrong thing. The concern for Terry Joe's safety was not necessary, as it turns out. Rather than head to the hospital in a made-for-TV movie pilot twist, Julian went to a motel not far away. He checked into the Sandman Hotel under a fake name, John Monroe, and paid cash for his room. Whilst there, he wrote a two-page note to his friend, whose name is literally Jim Boozer, and <laughs> pinned $10 to the pillow of his bed. And what? Was, pinned $10? He put 10 bucks to the pillow of his bed and that, oh. for a reason. Is it okay. for breeze Around two hours. Blow? I think it's for bleach. Oh. Around two hours later, a maid, who was basically the junior stew in this story, <laughs> went to the room to do a turn down and couldn't get into the bathroom, mostly because Julian's body was wedging the door shut. Once the police yes. opened the door, they found Julian deceased. He had died by suicide by slashing his thigh, ankles and jugular vein. Oh! He actually went to town on himself a bit. Oh, God. Oh, God. The thigh cut was to the bone and he weirdly smeared oh. his blood on the walls. And the cuts on him were repeatedly, repeated and deep slashes, which did initially have the cops wondering if it was a murder being staged as a suicide. Whoa. It was that violent on himself. Oh. So whilst the note itself, the two-page note, gave no explanation as to what happened, it did say, I'm a nervous wreck and just can't continue. I'm going out now. I guess I either don't like life or I don't know what to do with it and, ended, and, and then it ended with the words, I got too tired and nervous. I couldn't stand it any longer. The note also requested Mr. Boozer take care of his 14-year-old son, Lance, and that he was to be buried at sea. His friends said, mainly Mr. Boozer, said the loss of the Bluebell, his wife, and the Duperol family was just the final straw for Julian. Julian had also lost one of his earlier wives in an accident many years oh, earlier. what a coincidence. And had struggled with injuries sustained in the wars. And he did actually have a couple of serious injuries due to his rather risky job as a fighter pilot. Uh, he lost two yachts in the past as well. When I say lost, I don't mean misplaced. Yes. Unfortunately, sunk one when it ran up against a, you know, a, a, what do you call it, a, a sunken ship. He, bas- he ba- accidentally bashed one of his, thank you, a shipwreck. He bashed one of his fancy yachts into a shipwreck, which was a shit. Um, and then I can't remember what, that was the, it had a funny name. I'll come on to it. It's there somewhere. And the Valiant was the second boat that I think caught fire. It wasn't the Costa Concordia. It was a, it was a name that I don't know why you would call a boat this. And it was the, something or other. It finishes with albatross. I mean, why would you there yeah, the torbatross, which is like an albatross. It's probably just another form of bird. But you know, with all the superstitions about albatrosses, I don't think I would be using a tross in any boat name. No. Oh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but the bluebell had originally been called the Lady Jane. And for those of you who may not be oh, familiar you with can't the superstitions, change the boat's name. that's right. Oh, I've forgotten cannot, about that. Yeah, yeah, you can't change a boat's name. Oh. Any sailor will tell you that's very unlucky. And not, cannot. Yep. So I don't know whether his other boats had ever changed their names, but he was a very unlucky guy who had just taken as many knocks from life as he was able to, and that's why he just decided to get out. Meanwhile, Terry Joe is in hospital, and she's not talking about what happened. She's just trying to get better. She did receive incredible care from the staff and there was a huge amount of media attention about this poor little girl found floating around in the sea and the media at the time dubbed her the sea waif. 
they they wanted to get in and see her and they she was very protected by the staff like no one had let the reporters come and see her they sort of suggested or the doctors sort of thought maybe she was in shock and she didn't really understand what had happened she totally understood what had happened oh Hence, she didn't trust anyone, didn't want to talk. Wasn't ready to, I don't think. But um, by November 20th, so seven days later, <clears throat> Terry Joe was well enough to talk to the investigators about what had happened on the Bluebell. Now, Here I don't know go. if you guys have seen the film Dead Calm. Yes. Yes. So have. cue Billy Zane now to yeah. play the part of Julian yes. Harvey oh. in a weird kind right. of reboot of Dead Calm. Right? <laughs> Was that with Nicole Kidman? Was she the other one yes. in this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Did she have yeah. a fake nose? No, not fake nose. No, no, no. That's the other one, the hours. As Terry the tells hours. the story, <laughs> late on... Late on November 12th, the Bluebell began its return journey to Fort Lauderdale. So they'd gone out, they'd had the lovely time in the Bahamas, the islands, and now they were coming back. At around 9pm, so about half an hour from when he said, yeah, Yeah. Terry Jo had entered the lower cabin to sleep, leaving her parents and siblings, Julian and his wife, on deck. Later that evening, she was awakened by the sound of her brother screaming and calling for his father to help him and heavy footfalls, which she decided to investigate. Above deck, she observed the bodies of her brother and mother in the main cabin, not far from the galley, lying in a pool of blood. And she said, you know, she knew instantly they were dead. Walking further into the deck, uh, Terry Joe then observed Julian carrying something that could have been a bucket. Not really sure. He then slapped her across the face and shoved her back below deck, shouting, get back down there. And, of course, she's an 11-year-old girl. She's just seen what looks like some of her family dead. There's no sign of where her father is or Renee. And this man has just belted her and sent her downstairs. So she did as she was told. She went back into her cabin and I think probably just cowered there for about 10, 15 minutes until oil and water started to gush over the cabin floor. At that point, Julian appeared in her at the cabin door with what she thought was her brother's rifle in his hand and he's, apparently they looked at each other and then he just sort of went back up on deck. When she tells this later, it's like that was a moment where she thought he was going to shoot her and then for whatever reason he just yeah. walked off. He's obviously thought the boat will take her. Yeah, I reckon. There's there's a few moments in this where it could have gone another way. Uh, She had then heard what hammering sounds, which I think she thought at the time was the engine, but later she thought, no, I think it's the sound of the dinghy hitting the side of the boat, you know, because it's bashing into it. As the water was rising, Terry Jo made her way up on deck, freaking out at the idea she might run into the floating dead body of her mother or brother. Did I mention dead calm? I don't know if you remember that bit, but there's a bit where Sam Neill goes down into the boat. Quick recap from my memory, Billy Zane's on a boat that's sinking. Uh, Nicole Kidman and Sam Neill come along to help him. He, I think, knocks Sam Neill out, leaves him on the boat that's sinking, and he steals their boat with Nicole on it. So while Sam Neill's trying to get the other boat going so he can rescue his wife, at one point he opens up a saloon, basically, the saloon downstairs, and it's full of water and there's all these dead bodies floating in yes. there. It's a it's yes, something that has yes. never ever got out of my <laughs> mind. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so she was a bit freaked out about having that experience. Unfortunately she didn't. Um Julian saw her on the deck and asked her if the dinghy was loose and she said, I don't know. He got her to hold the dinghy rope while he went to get something. She let she just let go of the rope and of course he saw that the dinghy was going to float off so he t- he jumped overboard, swam to the dinghy, which was also dragging the boat's life raft, which basically left Terry Jo alone on the deck of a fast-sinking boat. And she didn't know where Renee was at that point? or, no, or her dad. Or, or, or Denny. Or, or Denny. The only two people that wife, she yeah, was yeah. aware of where they were were the brother and the and mum. Mum, mum. So that's yeah. Jean and Brian. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, at this point, and I can't believe this, in, well, I mean, I believe it, but I just think... Sometimes it's just incredible the things that are clear in people's heads. I don't know that in her situation I would have thought to do this. But she remembers the small oblong cork float which was lashed to the deck, which is basically another one of these lifesaver type things, Mm -hmm. but it's oblong shape. So she untied it, threw it overboard and jumped in, swam over to it, and that was what she was found on, this float. The float was so small that she had to sit upright in it to avoid falling into the water. Three and a half days she had to sit up. There really wasn't anything separating her from the sea as it was basically just this life ring with a bit of a net under it. So it's a bit like, you know, 
a pool toy, really, yeah, in some yeah. ways. Mm. Mm. So she floats around with no water. She's being nibbled on by parrotfish. She was followed at one point by some porpoises, which made her feel a little bit better because, you know, they, they made her feel safer. She had a few hallucinations as things got bad where she imagined that she was, it was something along the lines of her father was, they were getting on a plane and her father's like, come on, Terry Joe, we've got to go. And he gave her a glass of wine and she'd never drunk wine before, but she remembered it being refreshing and sweet. And then, of course, she woke up. At, I think on the second day there was a plane flying over her and so she's madly trying to, she took off her blouse and she's trying to get their attention. It actually circled her and she thought maybe they'd seen her, but unfortunately they hadn't. She also reported that she was aware of boats going past her, like, you know, a K or so away, like big steamer boats and uh, steam boats, you know, um, tankers and stuff. Yeah. She saw their lights and that, but no one had seen her. And she's a tiny little speck on the sea. She was adamant that the mast of the Bluebell was intact. Uh, there had been no fire aboard the vessel and the sea was calm throughout the entirety of the events prior to the sinking. So after they've got this statement from her, she's then told that Julian was picked up three, alive three days before her in a life raft alongside her dead sister's body and the bodies of her parents, her brother and Mary Denny had all been lost to sea. When she first was found, she said the word bluebell. Mm -hmm. She was also gesticulating and she went like this. She, she said bluebell and was, and they knew that the bluebell had sunk because Julian and Harvey had told them. But she was saying, you know, basically it's gone down and I'm Terry Jo and that was it. She did know what had happened. Like she was quite aware that the, the boat had gone down. With Terry Jo's testimony, Julian's life came under the microscope. At the time of the drowning of the second wife, now this is a weird name, her name is spelt like Joanne without an E, but I've also seen it written Joan. Second wife, Joanne Harvey. So they were looking at that. The Florida police and the diver who inspected the sunken wreck of the 1946 Plymouth and Joan's father all wondered how he could have escaped it. So the story of that is he's driving along with his mother-in-law and Joan and they, are, they went to the movies and they're on the way back from the movies and they're going over this little wooden bridge and the car just for no apparent reason veers to the right and he steers it hard to the left and then they go over the bridge and they land in the bayou. And according to him, he was able to miraculously jump out of the car as it was falling off the bridge. And so he's that unharmed. Sense. Unfortunately, Joanne and her mother, though, were drowned. And no one could really, you know, like, and apparently at the time he's standing on the bridge when other people come along and they're trying to help these women they're already dead by this point, but they're trying to help these people in the car. And he's just going, oh, look, it's probably because I jumped out of planes all the time. <laughs> you know, not seeming bothered at all that his wife's just died. So there had been some questions about that one back in the day, but there wasn't really that much evidence. So people had questioned it, but they didn't really do anything about it. Apparently the diver at the scene had said at that speed and short distance, it seemed unlikely that a man could get out of the car before it struck the water, unless he was ready Prepare to get out it. of it. Yeah. Yeah. More likely he was in the car as it entered the water and he swam out, leaving the wife and his mother-in-law to drown. And the other thing I read was that the car doors were all shut but the driver's window was down. Yeah, funny that. And again, his, those terrible uh, boating accidents I spoke about earlier were now viewed with suspicion. The sinking of the Torpatros, bad name for a boat I reckon, looked fishy. <laughs> <laughs> One of Harvey's passengers on that trip reported, I remember we sailed around the wreck twice. Harvey said he was trying to read the markings on the buoy, or as they say in America, buoy. 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 But the former Commodore of the Capital Yacht Club, home birth of the Torpatros, said, everybody who has sailed those waters knows about the Texas and just stays away from her. The wreck is way off course. You have to work at it to find her. This is the one where he rammed his boat into the Texas. At the time, a federal court awarded Julian $14,258,000 damages for the loss of the Torbatross, which I can't remember what it is in today's money, but it was like a hundred and something thousand. His other yawl, the Valiant, had also been sunk and apparently he'd told friends that that was definitely by him for the insurance money. Hmm. He was also a pretty fickle husband, as I said before, telling all the exes at one time or another, I don't love you anymore, go get a divorce. Ethel, <laughs> wife number one, not counting the uh, annulled marriage before it because it really wasn't a marriage because it got annulled, she said, I don't think I satisfied him. I don't think any woman could. He was very egotistical. He worried about himself. He weightlifted a lot. <laughs> said number three, <laughs> Jitty, I don't know which wife I was. It wasn't like being married anyway. He was constantly interested in his body. 
Ooh. Finally, the fact that made the most sense out of all of his past was that he had taken a $20,000 double in indemnity insurance policy out on Mary Deeney two months before the Bluebell massacre. Oh. He was massively in debt and being hassled by creditors. So this Sit fact down. does look pretty bad, yeah. Whilst he had a slew of ex-wives, none of them thought he was capable of murder. I read one of them said something like, I never thought he'd kill me, but then again, he didn't insure me. (laughs) (laughs) The the investigation ended with the conclusion that Julian had intended to kill his wife for the insurance money, but perhaps was witnessed by Arthur and he had fingernail scratches and stuff on him, which suggested that she'd fought and maybe Arthur had heard it, seen it happening. Inter- interjected, got Where murdered. was Arthur found? He wasn't. Oh. We don't know really what happened because all we know is what Terry Jo saw and she didn't see her father, Mary Jo, De- uh, Mary Denny or But how do you know Renee? the scratches then? I'm confused, right? Julian had scratches on him. So oh, sorry, after, that makes it. Yeah. Got it, right, yeah, yeah. got it. So the Venice struggle, yep. So he'd been fighting probably with his wife. This is th- this is the theory of what happened and we will never really know. But, yes, so he was, the idea was that he had intended to kill her he wanted to use having some people on board as a kind of inadvertent corroboration of his, his situation. So say he strangles her in their cabin, slips her overboard during the night and says, oh, she must have got up and she's disappeared. The other guests she, are like, where yeah, is she, yeah. where is she? There's no sign of any problem between them prior to that, so why would anyone think that he'd murdered her? And he gets away right. with murder and he gets the insurance. But we think what maybe happened here was that he – was part one of the plan didn't quite go according to that because she fought back, she might have made a noise. Arthur then got involved, strange, possibly got yeah. Mo- killed. Yeah. Most likely in the front cabin that was the cruise cabin, which is partly why Terry Joe didn't see anything because yeah. they would have been away from everyone. Right. Then he comes now, he's in this kind of like, shit, I've got to get rid of everyone. He comes down, he stabs Brian. He's, well, he stabs probably Jean first, then Brian. Because yep. Brian, remember, was screaming oh, at God, Daddy, yes, help yeah, me, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help me, Daddy, help me. And Daddy was probably already dead by this time, unfortunately. Oh, my God. We're not really sure about what happened with little Renee because she had a little bit of what could have been anti-mortem bruising but not enough to suggest she drowned, right? So we know that she drowned. They did a a post-mortem on her but there wasn't enough sort of other any physical evidence that suggested he'd hit her or anything like that. Possibly he just threw her in the water or she fell in the water in an altercation. She did have a life jacket on. She wasn't a strong swimmer. She was seven years old. She And or the other option is that he did actually pull her out and then drowned her when she was in the dinghy. We don't really know because he had to get rid of all of them. The weird thing is, and this is the question that a lot of people wonder, is why he didn't just outright kill Terry, Terry Joe, right? So because if he had gone out of his way to kill everyone else, why not her? There are two times like with the rifle moment and then, you know, I said he he looked like he went to get something while she's holding the rope for the dinghy. She drops it and then he just jumps in the water to get the dinghy. She definitely felt like he had looked at her and thought, I better clean up this. He turned to get a knife or something to smack her with and kill her. She dropped the rope and then that changed his mind and he just thought, I'll just leave her to let the ocean do it. And that's why he was, and he was quite shocked when obviously that she was found alive. So I think he was just really busy and just thought, oh, well. (laughs) It'll just happen. I can't do it all. I can't do it all. No. Oh, Other that, interesting things. That's a lot to me. It. Yeah, I've got a lot going on, right, Pamela? Yeah. I can't, I, can't, I can't do it all. No. Can so anyone I'm... step up to the plate? The other Far in... out. <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't mind killing yourself, Terry Jo, I'd appreciate it. Come Been pretty on. Busy. Do something for once. And I just, just stand there dropping the bloody rope on the dinghy. The other thing that was interesting was they weren't actually very far from a coastline where there was a lighthouse. The people in the lighthouse never saw any sign of a fire. They, they never noticed a boat burning in the distance, which they should have been able to see on that night. Similarly, he steered away from the lighthouse and away from there. He actually, I think that was east. He actually went west. And the idea, they thought that he probably wanted to put more time distance. and distance between himself and the bluebell. A, making it hard for people to find the bluebell if they were going to, and B, also making it more sympathetic that he's floating around and he's been lost at sea and what have mm-hmm. you. Mind you, as I said, mm-hmm. he had the life raft on him, he had flares, he had food, he had water. He he actually, in that time after whatever had happened and he was scuppering the boat and sinking the boat, he was throwing stuff so that he would survive. Terry Joe then goes off to live with her aunt and uncle, I think back in Wisconsin, And, you know, she grew up with an extended family that loved her and there were a lot of people who looked out for her because they knew about this terrible situation. 
But being the 60s and no one really thinking about psychotherapy and stuff, they never talked about it. It was never mentioned. She didn't call her aunt and uncle mum and dad, but, you know, like it was just sort of awkward and she and she always felt like she was that girl, you know, well, that's that girl who lost all, you know, every, yeah. every room she went into. So she never spoke about what had happened beyond telling given this testimony initially to the investigators. She went home, she never talked about it. They never talked about it. She changed her name to Terry when she was 12, was which makes idea. sense when you read it. Her name was originally Terry Joe with a T-E-R-R-Y. She changed it to T-E-R-E and she dropped the Joe. The whole thing was to try and distance herself from this image of the poor sea orphan pers- persona the media had given her. She could have done a better job of changing her name. To um, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Poor Terry. So far yeah. that's the bit of the story right. that's standing out for me. <laughs> yeah. She was only 12. You know. Yeah, it's a real when crime. When she did that, she was only 12. Absolutely. She got bad advisors. Well, the thing is she walked up to her aunt and uncle and said, I'm changing my name to Terry, and I bet, I bet they were a bit like, okay. Yeah, whatever, sure. Mm-hmm. They go, what? What from Terry Joe? You're doing what? Yeah, all right, Terry Gosh, Joe, that's a, Terry. That's a big shift, Terry. Well, Terry I don't think they yeah, probably no appreciate it. You. They were like, thank God. Well, they were like, well, we don't yeah. have to work very hard to remember what it is this, now, so that's okay. This double-barreled name's been doing our head in for 11 years, so thank <laughs> God you're going back to one name. She gets on with her life. She started to do radiology, um, but she found it a bit too upsetting because she'd have patients coming in and they had all the trauma, so she changed her um, degree and she then went on to have a very successful career as a water management specialist and she worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for over 14 years before retiring and uh, very much about conserving the coastlines and looking after the waterways and she she said things along the lines of the water protected me and saved me so I've dedicated my life to protecting the water. Wow, give back. As of 2023, Terry is 73 years old. She celebrated her 73rd birthday back in on February 9th in 2023, so I'm guessing she's now 74. She also has legally changed her name, as I said, to Terry, and um, <laughs> she married a couple of times. That's a big part of the story to get, get yeah, my head yeah. around. Um, oh. uh, she's very happily married, I believe, with a blended family and grandkids and is very grateful for her life. And she's married to a man who is a fast bender. I don't think, did you say Michael? Michael. Yeah. And apparently not. The book I quoted as a source, I actually left half of the title out on purpose so it wasn't a spoiler. But the book she wrote was all, it's something, it's alone, orphaned in the ocean or orphaned, something like that, orphaned on the ocean or something. So that would have given it away a little bit. And it's written by her and a bloke who she went to uni with who has a PhD in soul survivors, you know, so he's a psychiatrist or a psychologist and he does a lot of work around understanding the implications of being basically the only person who your family left to survive something like that. Right. And that, my friends, is the story of the Bluebell Massacre and the making of an orphan at sea. Oh, poor Terry, Terry. Terry, Joe, Terry. (laughs) <laughs> Why haven't they made that into a movie, Joe, Terry, Terry, um, Joe? Joe. Um, Terry I know, they might have. I haven't seen it if they have. I don't know where I've heard about it, but I have. It's worthy of a movie. Yeah. And when you look into um, Julian, he he actually came from really good upbringing. He had very wealthy parents, but then they lost everything in the Great Depression. Yeah. Because remember, he was born in 1927. But then they ship him off to live with his aunt and uncle or his grandparents who were, lavished him with everything. He was a spoiled kid, actually. Mm. And he was very happy. There was no suggestion that he was unhappy with any of that and he was doted on. And then, you know, he went off. He was a male model at one point. He just sounds like a bit of a player. He tried to have his hand at a bit of door-to-door sales work. Yeah. He was a bit introverted. And the first time he went up to the door, a woman answered the door and he ran away because he was scared. Kind of does put a scuppers, if you like, uh, a sales career. But then he went off and he was doing a male model. I've seen photos of him and he's not that good looking in a contemporary sense, but I think, you know how Kirk Douglas was like had a really fit body but a slightly strange face when he was young? You'd have to look him up. Maybe. Like, he, he was very muscular looking. No, I do. But he wasn't yeah, like yeah. hot wasn't. face, but he was all right. Yeah. This, this is what Julian was a bit like. He wasn't quite, he wasn't perfect, he wasn't an Adonis, but he had a very good physique which definitely attracted the women. I will say that when he was in the forces, uh, in the Air Force, he 
did quite well initially and then he got to some point where he probably lost his bottle a bit and I think it was at around 1952 and he was started to get known as the guy whose engi- uh, plane's engines would suddenly stop working and he'd have to fly back to base or he actually um, ditched out of a couple of, that's how he got injured was ditching out of a couple of planes. You know, at one point he fell on a piece of farm equipment or something and really quite badly injured himself. And he was picked up screaming, going, why does this always happen to me? I was like, well, if you weren't, I don't believe he was a coward. I believe he had a bit of PTSD. But if you weren't throwing yourself out of your plane, you might not have landed on some farm equipment. His girlfriend wasn't in the plane at the time? No, this is when he was in the uh, the Air Force with a co-pilot. It was all very... Top Gun, but it had that feeling about Top Gun. His wife, yeah. It was his... Did he stink? Second wife. Slider, you stink. You stink, that's right. So (laughs) I think by... I think he was discharged in 58 and I, I do very much see things about him that might suggest that he was losing it. He was cracking up. He was He was really struggling... As he gets older, his wives do report that he's nastier. He becomes, yeah, and he starts to show a slightly, not so much a violent temper, but a nasty temper. And it have uh, I think quite you're being too kind to him. Well, I'm just you're saying trying to find empathy where you don't need. I'm to. not empathising with him, but I struggled <laughs> as I went through this story to understand what on earth happened on that night for everything to go so pear-shaped. And I suspect that what I'm saying is that this violent characteristic was building in him. He started to show these behaviours. I think his, I don't know, fifth wife divorced him because he was unnecessarily cruel or something. It was mental cruelness, but he may have been physically violent towards her as well. So I just think it was it was coming. It wasn't there for, he wasn't necessarily born with these immediate behaviours, but I think they were built over time. Whether it was caused by trauma, maybe brain damage, I don't know. You know, he fell out of a plane a couple of times. Could have been all of the above, yeah. frankly. And- it could have been all of that. And when when things took a turn, or if he had a plan and let, we don't know, but let's say he did kill his wife first. And then someone else saw it. It's just one of those things that becomes something else to try and cover up that problem with that yeah. problem with that problem. Maybe... I don't know. It's hard to really know. I, I think guess. it's one thing to sink a boat for insurance. There's another to kill someone for insurance, though. Yeah, that's right. To, to me, the that's issue exactly. is if you get married once and it doesn't work out, no oh, problem, flag. remarry. <laughs> if that doesn't work out and you get married a third time, you know, oh, Look are you out. sure about that? I'm if you're Tony's third number wife. Four, yeah, I'm number three well, for Well, if you're number four is the one I'm calling out, oh. yeah, yeah, so so you're okay. <laughs> okay. Should there be a next wife for Tony, she should run. Red flag, absolutely. That's the if, problem. Oh, yeah, no, he was a shit yeah, husband yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely, terrible. Not not Tony. Carl, you Carl learn just, your lessons. <laughs> Carla just looked up at me no, like, what? Tony, I was yeah, like, I'm cool. talking about Julian, yeah. not Tony. He's a great husband as I knew you were going to. Yeah. Yes, we agree, but... But I do think we've, we've discussed this a few times where there have been people who have gotten married, you know, five or six times mm. and they've always been the problem in that. No one gets married five or six times and it's the, the sixth wife or the sixth husband who's the problem. It's always the, the person who I is onto their mean. sixth partner who is the problem. Well, of course it is. But so, the, the wives yeah. also, he didn't seem to tell them about the old wives either. So it's one of them's like, I don't oh. even know what number wife I was, you know. Not. One of them thought it was, she was his second wife when she was his fifth wife and, you know, like he was Just a, a of bit bullshit. of a bullshit artist. So you need to get Tony yeah. tattooed with I am Tony's <laughs> third wife, Caroline, <laughs> so that Wife number four will know. Just, just put in case. a tattoo that says wives and then just have three lines under it. Yeah, yeah. One, two, three. Yes. Yeah. Who's next? <laughs> like Tally Yeah, marks. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he would have had a pretty nice, he would have had one, two, three, four, five. That would have been a quite nice tattoo, the five tally marks and another one, six. He was really starting Gosh. to get there with the tattoo. The way the wives go was the first one, I don't know her name. She was a high school sweetheart. The parents managed to get that no annulled. No one ever does. Well, that got annulled, and I think yeah. that's why her name is left out. The parents so, got it annulled. Yeah, her parents young. or his? Probably both of them. I don't know. Um, her parents. Second wife, oh. or technically first legal wife, Ethel had a child by him, Julian Jr. Oh, yeah. We don't yeah, hear about Julian Jr. very much. About this. 
Ethel is then told after he does a spate in career or something, he comes out and says, I don't love you anymore, but you can keep the kid. She's like, cheers, thanks. So that's Ethel. Then the next one is Jitty. I th- no, the next one's Joanne or Joan, the one who dies. Who died, yeah. And then the th- one after that is a girl called Jitty that lasted five minutes. Then he's with Georgiana, and I think Georgiana had the one, Lance, had Lance, the child. The one he would have killed but for insurance. Possibly, and she divorced him because he was an asshole. At this point he yeah. had, that sh- and she actually was co-owner or something of the Valiant with him or the Torbatross. Like, so she'd been on the boat with him as well on one of those <laughs> stupid Torbatros. names. Um, on one of those two. <laughs> Torbatross. And then, and we don't, do, I'm pretty sure he sunk the Valiant. Anyway, sold off another boat. No one could understand what was going on there. And then he ended up being this captain of the Bluebell. But, yeah, Georgiana had got rid of him, but she she's the mother of Lance. And then they break up and then he marries this poor girl, Mary, Mary Deeney, her name is, and uh, she ends up lost at sea. So sentencing. Gosh. I'm going to let Terry off for changing her name from Terry <laughs> Joe to Terry because so. of the trauma she went through. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's the <laughs> obvious crime in this story. Obviously, so there's but, no punishment for anyone. That's really crime. The heck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, I mean, that's the obvious crime, right? That Because there's proof of that. That we, we all know exactly <laughs> what's happened there. But she does get a free card because of what she went through. I actually do think, in all seriousness, she must be a remarkable woman. Mm. But what a remarkable child. Mm. Yeah. Being 11 and having the clarity of thought and the yeah. will to live the way she did. Yeah, wow. Absolutely. Um, yep. So I love her lots. Him, I mean... Where do you start? What like what have you done for this world, mate? Six wives in and you realise that that's where you've got to kill them if he hasn't already done that before, which it sounds like yeah, he Yeah, he may. Well, I don't know if he killed his second wife. He certainly didn't save his second wife, but I'm not sure that he did any of it on purpose. I don't know. Yeah, well. I just don't know. I guess all I'm saying is that. He seemed happy enough at, to divorce six, them all, he definitely though. definitely did. So, like he didn't kill every wife, you know what I mean? Like so you well, kind of think, maybe, well, maybe maybe he just really hated his mother in law. Maybe he divorced number one, then thought he'd off number two, but the heat got up a bit much, so he went back to divorcing them because he didn't do a very good job of that. I, th- I think he does need to die a slow death at sea Ooh. in a raft. Oh, I know that's what I was thinking. It's, I know, know it's a bit obvious because I was thinking the same thing and I was like, oh, gosh, I need to be more. Yeah. It's just too easy not to put him in the situation that she was in but leave him out there for longer and, I don't know, I'm have more at things you, go past. Swanny, I'm surprised at you. Why? Yeah, that's not your Think about that's not your what vibe. was important to him. Normally. The money? His looks. Just his oh, looks? Oh, he was a massive narcissist. Well, I think you did it was all about being able well, to attract that, women, that use women, you know, his fit body, his curly blonde hair and blue eyes, and, and he really traded off it. I'm surprised that you uh, haven't just scarred him. I do think I've got that far. I was just, I was trying to work out how I could, I wanted to incorporate him being like at sea and feeling like he was being passed over mm. by passing planes, yeah, yeah. boats, and whatever else. For a prolonged period of time, so close, but he was just invisible um, and the suffering would go on and he was just, but I, I hadn't got as far as disfiguring him well, as well. That's why he's invisible because no, we disfigure sure. him. If, <laughs> yeah, sure, let's let's do that. Yeah. I mean. If he was in that pool toy that Terry Joe was in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. sharks came along and bit his he legs his bum. and his arms oh. off, but he survived, but we had to change his name to Bob. <laughs> Because that's yeah. what he did when he was in water. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a better punishment. My only fear with that, if 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 he was considered a hero, remember he was considered a hero before this happened. If he, if there was any doubt what what occurred before that, let's say he survived and he did lose his arms and legs, whatever else, and he was called Bob, and they still thought, oh, what a hero! I, we can't have that even possibly come into the yeah. equation. He needs to be. What if he was never needs found? Needs to be known what he did. No, I think it would be preferred if he wasn't able to commit suicide was found, and he had to but face shamed. face the uh, yes. I think that would be shamed and lose his looks. What are you doing? I'm going to sentence our mate Julian to spend the rest of his time. Yes, can't kill himself, but I think he needs to hang out with Billy Zane or at least Billy Zane's character in (laughs) Dead Calm on that sinky leaky boat that never gets fixed. With just this psychopath who, you know, at any moment is probably going to try and kill you and frighten you and that could be his perpetual punishment. 
That's my sentence. I was thinking like if someone like him being at sea would be where he'd want to be. So I would like to have something where he was unable to go. Maybe he became chronically seasick as well so that he couldn't even bear to be on the water because that's obviously he's had a love affair with it having, you know, pro- you know, people who like that kind of stuff always do like doing that. So he can't go anywhere near the water. He can't. He needs to have some kind of landlocked misery. Um, I don't know. What land base? Land lubber, is it? Land lubber. Maybe put him in the land put lubber. him in the bayou then where he left his wife. All yeah. right. Well, thank you for joining me on that uh, little adventure on the high seas. Now you know a little bit more nice about work. Below Deck also, so I'm sure you are yes. going to get out on Hey You or Netflix or Foxtel and start watching. You know, I can't wait. And as we say, yeah, I knew the, I was waiting for that. Um, <laughs> and as we say every week, no. <laughs> miss you already. Uh, ciao. ciao. Ciao, ciao, darling. Thanks for listening to Trial by Wine. You can contact us at trialbywine at gmail.com. Please rate, review and subscribe to Trial by Wine on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at www.patreon.com, Trial by Wine. Or visit our website, www.trialbywine.com to donate to us. Your support will help us cover many more cases and apply wacky sentences. We really appreciate you listening and hope you tell everyone about us. Our cover art is by John Christo and music is by Beauchamp from pixabay.com.